Hello there, this is Dan, and you're about to listen to an extract from an episode of the Lee Cushing podcast. Unfortunately, our homepage at noisybout.com is no longer online, but we hope to have a new homepage set up soon. Watch for updates on Facebook and Twitter under at Lee Cushing Pod. In the meantime, stick with our home on YouTube and Bid Extra Solutions Limited to hear more extracts like this one. The presenters are Howard and myself, and the music is by Greg Hume. London, England. Sometime near the end of the reign of Queen Victoria, vaguely. It's time for your appointment, Mr... Ah, uh, Dr. Freud, please call me Sherlock. Sherlock? Yes, I'm rarely so informal, but with you, Dr. Freud, I feel we are kindred spirits, although we have never met before. Well, this is very flattering. Both intellectuals, unafraid to battle against the prevailing intellectual tide of their times. I've read so much about your fascinating investigations into the human mind, though I must confess, you are not quite as I expected you. Oh. How so? I was expecting a, a smallish man, bearded, about my age, with a comedy Austrian accent. You have a stern British accent, although you're somewhat foreign in appearance, and you're both noticeably younger than me, and very tall. Yes. Well, you see, for the purposes of this sketch, it's as if I am played by Christopher Lee. Ah, of course. I can sort of do the accent, if you'd like. That is within my ability. Pray do. Sit down, Sherlock, and please explain to me what is on your mind. I have a recurring nightmare. I am running through moorland at night in a, in a swirling fog. There is an animal pursuing me. I cannot see it, but I hear its growls and snarls. I am attempting to outrun it, but I am aware that I am crossing through marshland, and I have a terror of making a misstep and, and slipping into the mire. Then I freeze as I hear a, a dreadful sound. The shriek of a man ahead of me, who has made that very mistake, the scream smothered as he slips beneath the mud. And then I see the creature. Ahead of me it has leapt from the mist and I am trapped in its path. It is a vicious looking dog of tremendous size. One might call it a hound. A vivid and terrifying nightmare, no doubt. But why does, uh, why does it trouble you so? It is a dream I've had before, some years ago. It used to play me regularly until I was engaged to solve a peculiar mystery down in Dartmoor, a mystery involving just such a terrifying beast, and which would draw me into those very marshes. After this adventure, the nightmare lost its grip. It ceased until now? It did. And is the dream you're having now exactly the same as the one you used to have? Almost precisely the same, but for some small surface details and production values. And what varies you particularly is... Well, oh, sod it. Um, and what worries you particularly is that when you had the dream before, the experience of solving a mystery which featured many of the dream's elements seemed to purge the nightmare from your mind. But this time... This time, surely no such mystery is afoot. And so how are you to purge the dream? Precisely. I think, though, Sherlock, that you underestimate both the strangeness of life and the power of the mind. There is evidence for the existence of precognition, a mental faculty which we may all possess, especially those gifted with a mind such as yours. You are suggesting that my earlier dreams were mere foreshadowments of the mystery I was to solve. Premonitions, which proved truthful. Perhaps you would do well to heed them again. Because they warn me that the experience is about to recur? Indeed. But surely a person could never be called upon to solve the same mystery twice. It is a remarkable world, Sherlock, and you are a remarkable man. If anyone could succeed in such a feat, I feel it would be you. Well, I find that oddly comforting. I thank you for your time, Dr. Freud. I thank you for your faith, Sherlock, although I too am a little surprised to find you consulting me. I also have read of your work, and I did not think you were the kind of person who would seek my services. Mm. I confess I am feeling out of sorts at present. Perhaps it is the 7% solution. Ah, there I cannot help you. Indeed. Well, I must go to my next appointment. I am due at the annual general meeting of the Society for People, people who... People who periodically think they are Sherlock Holmes. Quite correct. 
How did you know? I'm going there too. Of course you are. Okay, so this month we'll be talking about the Hound of the Baskervilles, and as the um, listener might recognise, we just had a little bit of music from the wonderful James Bernard there. I think uh, that's his theme tune from this film, The Hound of the Baskervilles, and I think it's one of the, one of the few which isn't based on the syllables of the title. Oh uh, yes, probably yes. It's like how I think if you leave the thes out. So it's kind of like Hound of Baskerville, <laughs> maybe, but um, uh, it could be It is Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> it is Sherlock Holmes. It could be, I don't know. That's, um, I think probably, yeah, he probably did write it like that, and he was desperately hoping that they'd make sequels to it so he could just reuse that over and over. But sadly, he didn't. Something that I'm starting to realise as I'm getting older is these films are not that old. Fifty years ago is not actually that long. When I was first becoming a horror fan and I was 12, 13, 14, they seemed ancient, yes. um, you know, and, and fascinating for that reason. But now I'm 35, you know, I'm not that much younger than these films in some ways. And soon, and you know, Aliens is 30 years old this year, you know, but these but wonderful movies don't age in the same way. No, of course not. And, you know, we should keep refreshing them and, and, and finding reasons to rediscover and love these these movies um and you know that's what this podcast is all about so let's get going the hound of the baskervilles hound of the baskerville 1959's the hound of the baskervilles which was i believe the third of the gothic horror films that hammer made to feature both peter cushing and christopher lee yes um so it was between so they made the mummy before this no this was after dracula but before the mummy right um, and it was made because um, there was a young American producer called Elliot Hyman whose father ran a sales organisation that did some dealing with Hammer and he was just kind of inspired by uh, meeting them to, to get into the film production business and he had no experience but he had a bit of money and he had Hootspah and he basically bought the rights to The Hound of the Baskervilles I mean, um, I think... Sherlock Holmes is probably public domain now uh, because Conan Doyle, who wrote the stories, um, died in the 30s, the early 30s, I think. But obviously, you know, they were not public. In those days, um, copyright meant that 50 years after an, uh, an author's death, they still held the rights to their work. So it was less than 50 years since Conan Doyle had died. So you still had to pay money to the, the Doyle estate if you wanted to dramatise Sherlock Holmes. So Hyman bought the rights to just the Hound of the Baskervilles, not the whole canon of books. And he took it to Hammer. And Hammer went, great idea, it's sort of horror. Um, and in fact, apparently in the American print of this film, um, he is, uh, Elliot Hyman is credited as the co-producer, but he's not on the British version. On the British version, it's just Anthony Hines, who was you know, the production head of Hammer at the time. And I want to correct myself on this because I think in a couple of podcasts ago when we were talking about the, the inception of Hammer and stuff, I talked about Anthony Hines is the fact that he wrote scripts under the name John Elder. Mm. But also his I said his real name is Anthony Hammer. And there's a lot of pseudonyms going on. Not true. Uh his real name is Anthony Hines, but he was the son of William Hines whose stage name, he was a performer, like a musical performer, was Will Hammer. And that's where we get the name Hammer Film Productions. But it is true that Anthony Hines wrote under a pseudonym, and so did Michael Carreras, who was his cousin, I think. Now I'm get... It was a family business, guys, and it was complicated. Um, but MC Hammer's name really is MC Hammer. That That is a fact. That's absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. that's cast iron. Yeah, there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of pseudonyms in Hammer because people were doing several different jobs sort of at the same time, and so producers were writing scripts or whatever, and or people had to step in and take over things. And I think there's a certain um, feeling in a family business that you don't want it to necessarily seem like a family business, which is why it was called Hammer Films, not Heinz Films, um, and and you know and and they're encouraging. Uh, people to go by the, the, the names of Carreras and all the different pseudonyms to, to prevent the impression that it's just like 
a small family firm, which basically was. Yeah. Um, I, I reckon. Um, That's what people say. People who people who worked on those films said there was a kind of family atmosphere. That's why they enjoyed working on them. That's why people kept coming back yeah. and kept doing them because it was a nice atmosphere on the set and everything. Yeah, and this film, I mean, we talked about The Curse of Frankenstein um, a couple of months ago. And this film is basically made by the same crew in the same building. You know, um, the director of photography is Jack Asher, uh, the production designer Bernard Robinson, the music, James Bernard, all those people are, are in place who, who were in, on the previous movie, the editor, James Needs. Um, but it's not written by Jimmy Sangster, who had um, written the scripts for Ghost of Frankenstein and Dracula. It's written by a man called Peter Bryan, who's speaking of... Um, People doing multiple jobs. He'd been a Hammer camera operator. Yeah. That's how they knew him. But um, he was already a playwright, I think. They knew that he's, he, he'd like written um, plays for amateur theatre or something. So they knew that he had that kind of flair. So that's why Anthony Hines decided to give him the job of writing this. It may have also been that Jimmy Sangster was just too busy. Jimmy Sangster would probably have been writing The Mummy at this point. And, and the production started to uh, overlap a bit. Because not only have... The, the, the three movies starring Cushing and Lee, uh, Curse of Frankenstein, Dracula, the um, Hound of the Baskervilles, those are one kind of train. But as, at the same time as making those movies, Hammer were making other films. Um, and we'd already had a, a Frankenstein sequel, The Revenge of Frankenstein, starring Cushing. Um, yeah, and a couple of other things. And, and, and they're non-horror productions. They were already making movies based on sitcoms and things. I only asked and stuff like yes. that. Um, Bernard Breslau. Yes, and uh, you know, and yeah, cool. as we talked about last in last podcast, yeah, the, the Quatermass sequel and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, you know, so um, so therefore you you get the the next film in the sequence in the Cushing Lee sequence, the Mummy, like that doesn't have James Bernard on the score. I, I think just because they were starting to make too many films and people were getting too busy, and and they they had to they had to get more people in to do them. But yeah, so we have the Hand of the Baskervilles kind of. Another reason that Hammer kind of snapped up the the idea of of doing a new version of Hound of the Baskervilles, uh, there'd never been a colour Sherlock Holmes film, um, and this was the one Sherlock Holmes story that is almost a horror story. They thought they could fit it into their gothic horror mode, um, and so they 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 set about souping up the story a little bit to make it more to to make it fit better, and that's got. Um, uh, mixed results I think what do you think of this film well uh, mixed yes I've got mixed feeling like you say um, it's Hand of the Basketballs is like a horror story but it's not a horror story it is a whodun- it is a detective story it is a whodunit story there is a rational explanation see yeah. my like you say the Hammer style had been well established by then there have been three really su- three four really successful films Dracula Curse of Frankenstein Revenge of Frankenstein and the Hammer style which is very sort of like very sort of lurid and melodramatic and theatrical and pacey and a bit gruesome and everything. You know, it works brilliantly for Dracula and it works brilliantly for Frankenstein and The Mummy and, and the other gothic horror films. I don't think necessarily it works all that well for The Hound of the Baskervilles, which is a different kind of story. I just think there's a, um, a slight tension between trying to make a traditional hammer gothic horror film and trying to make an adaption of The Hound of the Baskervilles. I th- the two things don't quite fit together, don't quite go together because and so they have to they have to make it like a horror film so they have all these kind of like little they change things like for instance the villain has a webbed hand which he certainly does not have in the novel um and there's a subplot involving a tarantula which attacks various people which is not in the novel and there's i think there's the the place in where it's set it used to be they say it was somewhere where they used to commit human sacrifice and there's a blood covered dagger which features prominently in the story yeah no i think things are changed to make it seem more like a Hammer horror film, uh, which is fine. And it's entertaining. The film certainly is entertaining. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And like say, so all the production values are high. They're all there. Bernard Robinson and James Bernard, everybody's, you know, at their peak making this film. I just don't think the Hammer style is entirely appropriate for a story like The Hound of the Baskervilles. Well, I think you're right. And what I would say that you've picked up on there, and, you know, I, I, I enjoy this film a great deal. I think it's nearly a masterpiece, really. But... I'm also, as well as a Hammer fan and a horror fan, I'm a Sherlock Holmes fan. And I think it's not really a Sherlock Holmes film. And I think what you've picked on there is the fact that Hammer was 
developing an identity as a maker of gothic horror films, not just horror films, gothic horror films. And Hound of the Baskervilles is not a gothic horror story. No. It's a detective story, yes. I do think you could say it's like a horror story, or it's like um, a supernatural ghost story, with a rational explanation in the end, but th what happens on the last page doesn't really matter. Um, you know, it's how it makes you feel during the story. Uh, and I do think it is frightening, it is eerie. Um, but it's still not a gothic horror story. It's um, it's a, a kind of spooky, um, gentle, thoughtful, melancholic story. You know, the moors and things like that. Um, uh, it, you know, in the book, the, the, you have this massive presence of the moor and, like, the... the um, uh, the mire, which horses slip into, and eerie sounds coming across the moor and things. But, um, not really haunted spooky castles, and even Baskerville Hall isn't the scary place in the story. Baskerville Hall is kind of the safe bit. You go out of it, into the moor, and, yes. and that, you know. Um, whereas I think in the film, in this film, Baskerville Hall is clearly based on the template and, the, and some of the same set pieces as Dracula, uh, Dracula's castle, and a certain amount of Frankenstein's castle as well, you know. So I have a slightly conflicted opinion on it, but there's loads to say about how great it is, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I think it's a very good film. It's just, I think one of my problems with it um, is, I mean, I'm not a huge, I'm not a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. Mm. Columbo is my favourite detective, always will be. But I, Absolutely. I, do, I do enjoy... I, I think we should make it a point that Columbo gets mentioned <laughs> Columbo in every episode. Columbo because I love Columbo. I, I may find a sound effect that <laughs> I can insert whenever you make a Columbo um, reference. The rustling of a raincoat will be good. Um, I also, yeah, so I'm not a huge... I'm, I'm not that bothered, because I'm not a huge Sherlock Holmes fan. I'm not all that bothered if they change things, mm. you know. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think it should be sacrosanct. My point is that the things they change just slightly alter the emphasis oh, yeah. of the story to a... a a way that for me doesn't quite it doesn't quite work quite quite work. Well, I uh, I, I think it, it's, it worked it for Dracula. It worked for the Curse of Frankenstein. It works for the Mummy. It works for the Curse of the Werewolf. That style, brilliant. All those films are, are, mm. are, are classics, as far as I'm concerned. They're they're great. It doesn't quite work for this. I am a Sherlock Holmes fan, but I'm also and I'm also a Hound of the Baskervilles fan. It's one of my favourite stories. I've read it. Uh, I've read a, a sort of um, revisions of it. Um, I've seen many versions of it. I'll watch it to death. And I don't mind the people changing details because if they didn't, every time I watched it, it would be the same. Mm -hmm. And the Hammer one has a kind of slightly different ending, which I appreciate. Um, and I, I, I love it for what they did do. And, and every ver version is different in different ways, and, and, and I'm happy for that. Um, I, I just think my point is that it's still not a gothic horror story. You can no. uh, Dracula, Frankenstein, and the Mummy, which was obviously just is kind of a modern story based on a the Universal film. They already were Gothic horror stories, and and done in the Hammer style, they were just that, but more so. Whereas um, Hound uh, is kind of pushed towards the area of Gothic. But what? But I did think this when I watched it again. Uh, when you look at the story of the Hound of the Baskervilles, the novel. As I say, I don't think it's a gothic horror story, but the backstory, the story about Sir Hugo Baskerville, is. It mm. is a gothic horror story. Know then the legend of the Hound of the Baskervilles. Know then that the Great Hall of Baskervilles was once held by Sir Hugo of that name. A wild, profane and godless man. An evil man in truth. For there was with him a certain ugly and cruel humour that made his name a byword in the county. This man who's so um, powerful and ruthless and evil that people kind of say that he is satanic and he will basically do anything to get what he wants and he wants um, he wants to have his sexual way with anybody he, he, he chooses and he creates kind of orgy-like scenarios of debauchery um, and by doing all this, he, he, he is punished for doing all this, almost by this spectral figure of the Hound, which kills him and it becomes the legend. Um, and every version of the Hound of the Baskervilles has to include this story. It's kind of crucial. Um, and most of them film it. You get a proper flashback. Um, the one that I can think of that doesn't is the um, Jeremy Brett TV version, where the budget was cut. 
No. So, so you don't see it. It's all delivered um, by Jeremy Brett reading from the parchment. It's a uh, great opening. But well, it's a brilliant. Op- and this version, because it's done in the Hammer style, and that bit requires that style. This film has the best version of that story you'll ever see. It's just brilliant. And the guy who plays um, Hugo Baskerville, David Oxley, is incredible, I think. He really has a, a, an amazing demonic visage. She's got away. What does she think I am that she does this to me? Damn her, damn her! You there, let loose the pack! And you, my hunter at the door! He set the hounds on her. He kidnaps the daughter of a local farmer or something, and he wants to have his way with her. He had a bunch of bully boys who he would um, he would lord it over, and they lock her upstairs while they're, while they're having all kinds of debauchery downstairs. But then when he goes upstairs to get her, he finds that she's escaped. She's made it out through the window. And he then, in a rage, he sets off across the moor to hunt her down um, with his dogs as if she was a fox you know but when he finds her she's already dead and there's this hound creature which then kills him exactly how that happens is a bit different in the film and different in various versions of it but i think in terms of the atmosphere and the visualization of it and the characterization of it you're never going to get a better version of that story than what happens at the start of this hammer film of the hound of the baskervilles are we agreed on that oh yeah no i think it's a great opening yes um, and that part, yeah, that part's brilliant. Um, I suppose one of my problems with it, like I say, I'm not... I do think it's a great film. I do think it's a really enjoyable film. I don't want to kind of sound like I'm being disparaging or anything. Yeah, I agree. Um, and they're all great, in it? I think just one of my problems with it is that Sherlock Holmes himself is such a fascinating and distinctive character and so compelling um, and so kind of idiosyncratic and so kind of enigmatic and a, and, and a kind of ambiguous character. Um, but because... Th- this film is so kind of like pacey and so fast paced and everything. You don't really get that. I think it's it's plot kind of um, takes over from character. There's a scene in the novel of Hound of the Baskervilles, which is in most of the other film versions, TV versions I've seen, where uh, Dr. Mortimer, who gets him involved in the story, had been to uh, Sherlock Holmes's apartments one day. He wasn't there, but he left his walking stick. Mm. And uh, later on, when Holmes and Watson come back, uh, Holmes gives Watson the stick and says, well, describe the person who would own this stick, using deduction, using your powers of observation. And, of course, Watson says, oh, well, it's, it's an old man who lives in the town. And he gets it all wrong, basically. Mm. Uh, and he gives the stick back to Holmes and says, oh, very, very, very good, very good, Watson, but you're completely wrong. And then Holmes describes the character of the person who owns the stick and gets it all right. You know, he's a young man, whatever. Uh, and I think that's just a, a, a wonderful scene. It, it's it, a brilliant it, character it, sketch. Yes, it sums it up. just sums up describes the relationship between these two characters, why they're friends, why they're close, why they... And, you know, Holmes' brilliance and Watson's sort of lack of brilliance. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a wonderful scene, wonderful little character moment between them, and that's not in the film. Yeah, and it... it and those kind of scenes are not in the film. The, 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 the Sherlock Holmes just becomes like almost like a Van Helsing character. It's just sort of... A lot of the idiosyncrasies are not there, I don't think. Yeah, well, I think... It... I think the film plays down his kind of intellectual investigative methods and emphasises um, his fearlessness and his kind of attitude um, to other people and to what's going on. And you don't get the scene with the cane, but you do get the bit which Cushing inserted, which is a direct quote from a different home story, um, The Problem of Thorbridge, where he says, My professional charges are upon a fixed scale. I do not vary them, except when I remit them altogether. Uh, and things like that, you know. Um, and and it's a lot. A lot of it is more kind of how he treats people. I think we should just say, you know, we've somebody listening to this podcast who wasn't really familiar with this film at all might assume, but you know, obviously knows that we're the Cushing Lee podcast. Uh, might could easily have assumed that. Um, Lee plays Sherlock Holmes and Cushing plays Dr. Watson or something like that, you know. We've not we've not introduced that. So I think it's fair to say that um, 
uh, Hammer cast Peter Cushing as Sherlock Holmes. That that, that was like a no brainer. Yes. He just played Van Helsing for them, and he was the, he was their star. But there was also um, a developing kind of the a developing idea of Cushing and Lee as a pairing. It would be part of the package that Hammer sold. So Christopher Lee is in it. But he doesn't play Dr. Watson. Um, who does, Howard? Uh, Dr. Watson is played by a very fine actor and an important member of the Hammer Repertory Company called Andre Morel. Now, Andre Morel uh, had worked with Peter Cushing before. He was in the legendary um, BBC adaption of 1984 where Peter Cushing plays Winston Smith and Andre Morel plays O'Brien, the villain. It's amazing. Um, he also, uh, Andre Morel, um, is Quatermass, in Quatermass and the Pit, the television version from the 1950s. And he was a very distinguished actor. He'd worked with the Bolting Brothers, he'd worked with David Lean, he'd been in The Bridge and the River Kwai and things mm. like this, and Seven Days to Noon. He was, you know, a very respected actor. Uh, and Hammer, seeing how good he was, they cast him in several films, actually. Plague of the Zombies, I think, is, is perhaps his most famous part. Well, we've talked about that before. Yes. But he plays um, Dr. Watson in this brilliantly, because he's a brilliant actor. He's married to John Greenwood, by the way, so lucky man. Oh, I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, so yeah, there's a bit of an age difference, but you know, that's your yeah. business. Uh, and what's <laughs> kind of like, the thing about Hound of the Baskervilles, it's always to me slightly ironic that Hound of the Baskervilles has become the most famous and the most adapted Sherlock Holmes story, because Holmes is absent from the story from quite a long period of time. No, and, the lead character is actually Watson, really. Yes. And you need a really good actor to play Watson. Now, fortunately, they have got a really good actor to play Watson in this, so he has to carry the story for about 20 minutes. While, uh, sort of like Sherlock Holmes pretends, he says, he tells Watson to go to Baskerville Hall with Sir Henry and look after things, and I'll stay in London. Well, actually, Sherlock Holmes is living on the moors, watching everything that's going on. Um, but he's out of the story for about 15, 20 minutes. So, and every, every adaption of Hand of the Baskerville has that problem, is that Sherlock Holmes disappears for quite a long period of time. Yeah, and what's really annoying is that whenever somebody has an idea about let's do a new Sherlock Holmes, they tend to start with the Hand of the Baskervilles, which means if the film doesn't get sequelised or the series doesn't take off, that actor who played Holmes in it, no matter how good they were, only has one episode which they're hardly in. Yes. And I'm thinking of Tom Baker specifically <laughs> here. But also, you know, and sometimes... Thank God it happens like that, because otherwise we'd have loads of episodes of Sherlock Holmes starring Richard Roxburgh. But he oh, made yes. The Hound of the Baskervilles in 2002, that. which is not very good, and he is dreadful in it. But luckily the film is kind of still semi-enjoyable because he's in so little of it. Well, it's interesting because, like, obviously, I mean, the first of the Basil Rathbone films was The Hound of the Baskervilles, because it's such a famous story, so you start with that one. And that led on to a very successful series of films where Sherlock Holmes sort of somehow came up to date and was fighting Nazis and everything. Um, but again, you know, the problem with Hand of the Baskervilles is he, he's, Basil Rathbone isn't in it for, for quite a long period of time. Now, because Basil Rathbone was so great, and for me, he is Sherlock Holmes, he is a definitive Sherlock Holmes, he is the one I would say was the best. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, not a very controversial choice saying Basil Rathbone is your favourite Sherlock Holmes, but I think he is. I think it's controversial on this podcast, Howard. I don't <laughs> think you're allowed to say it on this podcast. Well, no, I, well, I think he is. I think he is the best. Okay. Um, but it's, yeah, it's curious that it led on because, it, you know, it is, it's not a problem, but it's, it's, it's always, and you're adapting Sherlock Holmes, you've always got to um, get over the fact that he's not there for well, a, a period of time in the story. I mean, I think, um, I think what you've got to remember is that it's a great story and it just happens to be that he's not in it very much. It's still a great story. The only time it's a problem is if you're using that story to set up a series about that character. So, you know, sensible Sherlock Holmes series don't start with The Hound of the Baskervilles. They leave that till later. In fact, the best ever Sherlock Holmes series, I think, is the, the adaptation they did on Radio 4 with Clive Merrison as Sherlock Holmes. And um, uh, Michael Williams, not the one from the Blair Witch Project, no, no. Um, as Dr. Watson. And um, they left the Hound of the Baskerville still absolutely last. But they kept the chronology of the stories exactly as it is in the as they were published. So before they'd actually aired the Hound of the Baskervilles, you'd have episodes where, where Watson was going, that's almost like what happened in that affair with the Hound of the Baskervilles. <laughs> but you'd never heard that. And then they finally did it. And it's... Um, and, you know, you've just 
um, you know, nailed your your flag to the mast of Basil Rathbone. And I'll say, I think Clive Merrison is the best Sherlock Holmes, and his version of The Hound of the Baskervilles is the best adaptation of the story that anyone's ever done. I just think, I've listened to it a lot. It's got an all-star cast. It's got Donald Sindon, for heaven's sake, as Sir Charles Baskerville. Oh. And he narrates the opening sequence, of which is the flashback to Sir Hugo and, and the legend and everything. And that is the only version of that legend which is anywhere near as good as the one in this film, I think. Because his voice is so rich and foreboding. There's a great bit, and he has a bit of extra dialogue, um... Sorry, I shouldn't talk too much about that, but um, there's a, a bit of dialogue that they've added to it that's not in the book, which I kind of wish was in every version of The Hound of the Baskervilles, where Sir Charles talks about the moor, and he says, you don't, know, you don't know the moor like I do. It's a living thing. It has moods and desires and secrets. And, you know, I'm just like, whoa, that's great. And that, that's the kind of atmosphere that I love, that the story has. Mm. It's kind of encapsulated in that line, and I, and I, and I love that in... Uh, and I want that to be any in, in a version of the Hand of the Baskervilles. It's not in this film, though. No. That doesn't mean I don't think this is an enjoyable film. No. That doesn't mean I don't think this is an enjoyable film. But again, it's because they've pushed it more towards the gothic instead of the eerie. Yes. You know, the gothic is... I'm, I, I don't pretend to be an ex... Although, you know what? I did do a unit in university about gothic fiction in, in relation to female literary figures. But I'm, I'm not an expert on, on, on what constitutes the gothic. There's a great documentary by Andrew Graham Dixon about how the origins of gothic literature in gothic architecture and how the mood for kind of slightly grotesque, slightly subversive, both fiction and um, kind of expressive architecture and things kind of all, all kind of grew together in the in the 18th century. But I think my instinct is that gothic horror is a bit more physical. It's a bit more violent. Yes. It's a bit more passionate. And I think The Hound of the Baskervilles isn't that, but it has that underneath it because that's all contained in the Sir Hugo story. But the actual, the, the story of The Hound of the Baskervilles is more about unease, um, fear, a sense of is there something supernatural going on, you know, um, and it, 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 it was kind of, it's the kind of thing which the films of Val Luton are full of, you know. Well, I was, I was just thinking then, I wonder perhaps if Hammer had made it in black and white, if they had made it like Quatermass Experiment, uh, rather than being a full-blooded, mm. gaudy sort of like uh, Technicolor horror film kind of thing. Well, that would, I don't know. I don't know whether that would have worked or not. I'm just, it was just a suggestion. I was just yeah, thinking yeah, about yeah. it then, sort of like um, doing it a different way. I mean, I don't think any Hand of the Baskervilles, any version of the Hand of the Baskervilles I've seen is definitive. I mean, it is quite a visual story and everything, but I don't know, you know, the Rathbone one is really good and he's great, but, and Nigel Bruce is great as well. Well, you know what, we should that. talk about that for a minute, that particular film, because in a way you could um, regard this as a remake of that, mm. because when this was made, that was the major cinematic Sherlock Holmes film. And, and here was Hammer doing it again in colour. Um, I keep gesturing, uh, listeners. You can't see it, but Howard can. I feel like I'm conducting something. I don't know why, it just helps. Um, yeah, you know, like Halliwell's Film Guide describes it as a spirited remake Spoiled by dogged hammer insistences on promises of death and sex. Well, in a way, that's kind of... I, I wouldn't go that far, certainly. I don't think it's spoiled. No. I just think it's... Uh, as a film, it's terrific. As a piece of entertainment, it works really well. It's just that as an adaption of The Hand of the Baskervilles, uh, things are changed which make the story less, slightly less effective, Yeah, I think. I agree. Um, well, but I, mean, I, th I think that's true of most of, of the versions I've seen. But so I think it's not just related to this one. Let's illustrate that by comparing it, though, to the Basil Rathbone one. The Basil Rathbone, uh, which I only watched recently. I, you know, I, I've seen all the other Rathbone films, but I'd save The Hound of the Baskerville Still Last because it is my favourite story, or one, of, you know, one of my favourite stories, and I love the atmosphere of it. You know, it's a big Hollywood studio production. It was um, made in the late thirties. 39, 39 I think it was, yeah. um, and it's kind of got everything that a Hollywood movie could do at the time you know it was probably I just kept thinking of Titanic when I was watching <laughs> it you know in in terms of that scale of production you know you don't just meet um, uh, Sir Henry Baskerville you see him come off the ship there's yeah. a scene in the docks you know you've got huge 
scenes in the streets of London where they've built sets of, of London streets filled with extras. You know, um, they the whole moor, um, you know, the, the, the bulk of the action is set on Dartmoor, which is where Baskerville Hall is and which is supposed to be haunted by the Hound. Um, they've built the entire moor in a studio. And they've used kind of model shot model sets of the moor to that the, the, they you know they use trick shots to make the moor look bigger than it is and all this stuff, and they pump a million tons of dry ice all over everything, so it's really atmospheric. Absolutely everything is on the screen there, um, and it pretty much all serves the story. So in a way, I think that's got a good claim to be the the ultimate version of the story, except that they add a kind of weird extra ending onto it. Which what didn't strike me as very good in in any way in that film, um, but um, but you know so that's what that's what kind of the Hound of the Baskervilles was cinematically, and it's a rip roaring adventure, um, and yeah Sherlock Holmes is not really the main character of it. Neither is Doctor Watson. So the top billing in that movie is Richard Green, who was a young. I mean, he was still a star when the Hammer film was made. He was the TV Robin Hood. Robin Hood, Robin, Robin Hood, Hood, riding through the glen. glen. Yes, which I remember from an advert more than from the original <laughs> series. Um, yes, I, we don't remember it when it was first on. I mean, you know, even I'm not that old. No, well, I've never seen it. Although, you know, um, and uh, but that was very popular at the time. It was the first ever filmed TV series of Robin Hood. Richard Green starred in it, but also produced it, I think. He was a yes. big, big noise. And then later he came, like a couple of years after this, or a year, he came to Hammer and said, will you make a film of my Robin Hood show? So they went, would we? <laughs> and um, Peter Cushing was cast as the Sheriff sure. of yeah. Nottingham in it. Um, so he's Sir Henry and the star, the matinee idol lead of the 1939 Hound of the Baskervilles. And he's great. You know, he's he, he's he's got again with the Titanic thing. He's got a kind of Leonardo DiCaprio thing about him. I think this young, um, marvelous, attractive heir apparent guy. Um, and then Hammer were like, "We're going to remake this," but they don't have the resources that 20th Century Fox had in the 30s. Um, so it's outgo things like any scenes on the streets of London. They've got no sets of London streets. They've got. They don't have those kind of extras. But those go. So the sequence in the in the book where, um, when uh, Sherlock Holmes has first kind of taken the assignment to try and protect Sir Henry Baskerville and thinks somebody's stalking him in London, in the in the book and most films, there's like a foot chase with hansom cabs where they they where somebody in a in a cab is kind of stalking Sir Henry and and uh, Doctor Watson and Sherlock Holmes chase him. That's not in the Hammer film. That that entire that that sequence is replaced by a moment in the hotel where Sir Henry has come to stay, where he finds that somebody's placed a tarantula in his baggage, and we have a, a tense sequence where a tarantula emerges, which is both cheaper and uh, more you know Hammer esque. Yes, it's more Hammer. And also, Sir Henry is played by Christopher Lee, which is a great bit of casting, I think, and it's the first kind of moment. Where you see, he's, it's the first film he's done for them where he's not the monster in some way. Um, and he really enjoys it. You know, he has, he kind of, uh, in the book, Sir Henry is um, a distant heir to the Baskerville title, who is um, grown up in Canada. In the film, he's, he's supposed to have grown up in South Africa. So Christopher Lee can just about get away with retaining his usual mm. English accent. And... He's striking and attractive, and and uh, has a certain intensity about him. And and he's he's not a lead for the film, but he's an excellent sparring character either with Watson or with Holmes. It's a great cast. It's again like a lot of the early Hammer films. A lot, a lot of all the Hammer films have got some great actors in it. There's the there's Sam Kidd. Oh yeah, who I think was in Sam Kidd and Sid James between them. I think appeared in every British film of the 1950s. They would they. I think right. Sam Kidd just sat in the canteen and people come up to him and say, Sam, can you just come and play? Part in this film would be a be a policeman or something. Yeah, I'll come and do that for an hour, and then because he was just he's just in he's just in everything back then, and 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 he's great. He's, he plays a coachman, doesn't he? Yeah, John the Measurer's in this film. John the Measurer, yeah. I mean, that's that's an interest because Dad's Army is kind of still current. 
You know, it's still shown on TV every week. Mainstream channel on BBC Two. You know, they can make a movie out of it, which they just have, which nobody saw. But everybody knew what it was because yeah. because Dad's Army is still... So in a way, John LeMessurier is like still alive. And then you watch The Hound of the Baskervilles and there he is, looking exactly like Sergeant Wilson. <laughs> although, even though it's ten years before that series was made. And he plays the butler in Baskerville Hall. What do you know about the legend of The Hound of the Baskervilles, don't you? Do you believe it? Do you really believe that there is a creature out there? I don't know what to believe, sir. All I know is that I've heard it. Heard its terrible howl on the night before Sir Charles died. And I never want to hear such a sound again in all my life. It's got a lovely way of being able to deliver a bit of exposition in a way that's kind of funny and has a character to it as well. He's got uh, Miles Mallison's in it and um, yeah, yeah. Ewan Solon, who in every Hammer film I've ever seen, he's in quite a few Hammer films, he, he was part of the Repertory Company in the early 60s, uh, who always plays bad-tempered people. Right. If you want somebody to be really gruff and grumpy, you go for Ewan Solon, because he's in The Curse of the Werewolf. Right. And all he, do, he, you know, he just, all he does is shout at people. Okay. Maybe you made more time to call this. Uh, and in this film as well, he's very grumpy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think, you know, so I don't know what he's like. Lovely man in real life, I'm sure, but... What name is it? Stapleton. I've not seen him in that much, but he has great presence. He's in a early Jack the Ripper yes, he's in, film yeah. as well. Early 60s Jack the Ripper film. So yeah, so you know, so we don't get any of that kind of turn of the century London atmosphere that you kind of expect in a Sherlock Holmes film. That's just not on Hammer's radar. They don't care. They'd rather get used to the spooky more in as an efficient and as sinister a way as, po as possible, which is why we get, you know, the, the tarantula stuff. I mean, I think most viewers now realise that tarantulas aren't that dangerous. But hell, you know, James Bond was very scared of one in Doctor No as well, which was only a couple of years later. So it's just a thing. I think I'd be scared of one if I saw one now, so I can quite understand why. Well, I Christopher suppose... Lee has a bit of a... Turn. <laughs> yeah, no, no, fair enough. And they do introduce a thing in the, in this film, which I think is a very good dramatic addition, whichever way you look at it, which is that Sir Henry has a heart condition. So and any scene of tension is automatically the more tense mm. because he has that vulnerability. And it makes sense in his family because he, he you know, Sir Charles Baskerville, uh, the whole story started by the fact that Sir Charles Baskerville's been killed mysteriously and he had a heart con condition and... Obviously, he suddenly had a heart attack. Was he terrified to death by a spectral creature? Did the hound really come for him? Kind of thing. That's that's what tips the that's what sets the whole mystery in motion. Yeah, and then when you get to the moors, it's uh, they filmed it in Surrey, um, and they did do some some bits of the moors are a studio set, very beautifully lit, very beautifully shot. Especially, you know, the the kind of marshes and the there's a central kind of ruined church that a lot of the action is set in. It just looks stunning. Um, and they did do a bit of filming down at Dartmoor itself, the, the real location, but that, but not with any of the actors, just for kind of insert shots and things. There is an atmosphere to it. That with oh, the, there's, there's a doomy atmosphere. It's not the seductively eerie atmosphere of the novel, but the, com the, the, the combination of the sets and the location filming and the James Bernard music are just kind of droning on that does it, it it creates a nice mood oh yeah no, it is a very atmospheric film and it's uh the production values are very high the sets and the costume or you know like i say everybody at hammer is is, is you know working at their at their peak at that time you know yeah. i just don't think i think we ought also mention um how good peter cushing is in this He's film because uh terrific. sherlock holmes is a character that's kind of peter cushing played several times it's mm. kind of associated with him but this was the first time this was the first time yes and what i was saying about um so many of those little character moments that are in the book are not in this film. It's a shame because Peter Cushing could have done them brilliantly. And he does oh, do yeah. them brilliantly in subsequent versions. Yes. Um, but they're not, he's not really allowed to play the character in this. He, he, again, he's sort of like the action hero, which he does terrifically. But because um, there's a later, are we allowed to talk about the later yes. BBC version? There is another. Peter Cushing is in another version of The Hand of the Basket. Well, that, one of the reasons I love him 
It's because he's in two versions of The Hound of the Baskervilles. It's yes. a bit like, I, I, I think of Bill Murray playing Scrooge twice, because he did Scrooge, and he also did Groundhog Day, which is kind of a version of A Christmas Carol, I think. Yes. Um, and, and, and I love seeing an actor get two opportunities to take the similar material from different angles. Mm. And we have that exactly here with Peter Cushing, because in 1968... The BBC had made a TV series of Sherlock Holmes. Well, in '65, they'd made a black and white TV drama series, um, just called Sherlock Holmes, I think. Or it's called The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. I'm not sure. Anyway, and it had Douglas Wilmer as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Stock as Doctor Watson. And it went down very well. Three years later, they paid some more money to the um, estate of Conan Doyle and said, well, "Right, we're going to do more." But Douglas Wilmer didn't want to do it. He felt that he might be typecast as detective types, which he, I guess he was. Yeah. And they then offered it to John Neville, who just played Sherlock Holmes in a film called A Study in Terror, Sherlock Holmes vs. Jack the Ripper, which is probably in the bag of death. Mm. And um, and he couldn't do it because he was the director of a theatre, and he just didn't have the time. So in a horrible th- oh, third choice thing, they went to Peter Cushing and didn't tell him he was third choice. And he went, yes, I'd love to, <laughs> to play Sherlock Holmes again. So he came and, and did that. And... Um, it was a, a nightmarish production that was under budgeted and badly produced. Um, went fell behind schedule very quickly, um, and was a bit of a nightmare for him because he hadn't done TV for like ten years. Um, and the fact that the schedules were so fast and it's kind of like theatre really. It was like learning a new play every week was doing a, an, ep, a, an episodic TV series for the, for the BBC, and um, by a certain accounts it was a very stressful experience for him and then because the BBC had not negotiated the deal um, like a, an exclusive deal with Conan Doyle Estate they then couldn't repeat it in its entirety and they couldn't sell it abroad to other stations which is why most of the tapes were junked yeah. so they made 16 episodes and I think we've got 6 that we can watch well, I've seen... There, there are a few available, yes, on DVD, and I've seen... The only one I've seen is The Hound of the Baskervilles. It was a very prestigious series, because I've looked... I've got this biography of Peter Cushing, and, and the guest stars, people like Dennis Price and Cecil Parker, sure. and people like that. So it was like, it must have been a big series. It. I mean, I suppose to people now, it does perhaps look a bit stagey and a little bit sort of... The I editing think, is a bit... People seem to be get cut off mid-sentence sometimes. Um, well, I think, bear in mind, it was the um, first... Uh, the first ever BBC drama series in colour. Things I don't mind it being stagey. That's the thing. I I quite like that. There is, I mean, there is a bit at the beginning. You say that the the, the version, the, ham, the Hammer version of the Hand of the Baskervilles, where the evil Sir Hugo chases after the girl, yeah. is the best version. In the BBC version, it might be the worst version. Uh, it's certainly got the worst uh, ho- riding a horse uh, sort of scene. Basically, the actor who plays Sir Hugo, an actor called Gerald Flood, is just bouncing up and down in front of a black screen. <laughs> uh, you don't even see the horse at all. It's just And then suddenly it starts live action, then he gets on this horse, and then suddenly it goes into still photographs. Yes, when he I, texts, I have seen like, this. I don't know whether they'd run out of money or that was some kind of artistic decision. I don't know, but it looks a bit weird. But once you get over that, I think it's great. I, I, I like the fact that it's quite... You know, that it's done like a play. Well, I think... I, I've not seen all of it. You very kindly lent it to me, and I've watched about half the first episode. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the rest of it, which I've not really had time. Um, but no, I, I like it a lot. I think it, because of that stage equality, because of the emphasis on people talking in rooms and telling stories, you've got the whole... You do see the flashback with Sir Hugo, but there's also a lovely scene at the beginning with Sir Charles Baskerville before he dies, telling the story to Dr Mortimer and Stapleton, I think. Yes. This is before Sherlock Holmes ever gets involved. You know, this is stuff that most versions of the story just ignore. It's not in the book. But it's a lovely, eerie scene. And it sets up the atmosphere and the plot beautifully. And that eerie quality that I was talking about being missing from the Hammer film is in the BBC one. Yes. Yeah, um, and Sir Charles is actually played by Ballard Barclay, who plays the Major. In Faulty Towers. Oh, right. But absolutely playing it, you know. You, you wouldn't know that. Completely different side, you know, playing it absolutely straight and, and being brilliant. But the reason I like this version so much, again, like I say, it is a bit, there are a few technical, it looks a bit, perhaps, I know, a bit old-fashioned to modern audiences. But because Peter Cushing has got so much of the original Conan Doyle dialogue to say, mm. you know, it's much more like he's being Sherlock Holmes. He's getting a chance to play Sherlock Holmes properly, as it were. 
you know, the, the whole range of Sherlock Holmes's character is there sure, yeah. for him to play. Uh, and I really like that. So kind of like, um, yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it simply because it's great to see him play Sherlock Holmes. Uh, and Nigel Stock's very good as Dr. Watson. It's, it's a very good production, I think. Um, got some eerie moments in it. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, uh, as I say, I've not seen all of it, but I've seen a bit of the location stuff. And it's the first version that anybody ever did where it's actually filmed on Dartmoor. And it looks very nice. And I love the way that, you know, when you're telling a ghost story, this kind of story, you've got to be very subtle with the style. Which Hammer were not. No. Hammer was all style. And that's fine. And I love it. But I think, you know, if if you want to cultivate an atmosphere of the possibility of a supernatural presence in human lives, then you just have to show human lives and then let the implications float in just from what you don't do mm. and in a way this production does kind of do that a bit by just showing Dartmoor and when they go to you know when they're on the train and the carriage going to Baskerville Hall it's not you know the, the photography and the music is not telling you it's scary it's quite jolly mm. you know yeah. um, but there's something um, a bit disquieting about it and that's kind of what it should be I think yeah Yes, it should be. I mean, yeah, you know, because, like I said, the Hammer style works brilliantly for Dracula and Frankenstein because those things are inherently absurd, you know, mm. those sort of creatures. They are, the, you know. But if you do them in that really pacey kind of yeah, you have, melodramatic way, you have way, to do them with works. style. Yeah, it's like unapologetically, yeah, you know, full on, and it works like that. It's sort of like we're not, you know, um, this is a slightly different kind of story. Um, but yeah, it, it has to be more unsettling, more unnerving more, you know, disquieting, rather than shocking, sort of, you know. Yeah, and as a result of that, though, we've got two very different versions of The Hound of the Baskervilles, which tell the story in very different ways with the same lead actor, mm. and contrast marvellously, and I'm really pleased that we've got that. Um, I've seen a bit more of the Cushing TV series and other things, which we'll talk about more. In uh, uh, we're going to do an extra to go out with this episode, where we'll talk about the, the actually several other Sherlock Holmes productions involving either Lee or Cushing, and we can talk a little bit more about the Cushing's TV series there and a few other productions that are interesting, and just um, other Sherlock Holmesy bits and bobs. But having said that, I think we should also mention um, Marla Landy. Yes. Um, uh, she plays the uh, uh, character who's kind of based a bit on someone from the book, but not really. She's quite different to most versions of this character in most films, and she's, I think she's supposed to be uh, like a girl who's grown up in Spain, but um, is English by descent and has been brought over and lives on the moor. And Cushing apparently spotted her and recommended her, and I don't want to say too much about her role, because it's kind of involved with the way the ending is different. But I think she's great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I can understand why Peter Cushing spotted her. <laughs> yes. Mm. Well, no, no, you know. Although she's a, uh, her, her character is a bit incongruous in the Sherlock Holmesy world, she fits in marvellously with the hammer tone. Oh, yeah, yeah. And what she, happened? I mean, did she go on to anything else? Well, she was an Italian actress and model. Uh, and, yeah, she went on to something quite surprising. She became a presenter of Play School. Really? Throughout the 1960s, yeah, yeah. Um, I Unfortunately, I can't really find any clips of her on, on YouTube or whatever, but she is, I found various mentions of her. So she did a few films, um, and, you know, she did a lot of modelling in the 50s, and then later on became a children's TV presenter. And wow. I think she was like Miss Spain or something. Oh, no, sorry, Miss Italy or something like that. You know, she's quite a celebrity in her own country, who then kind of came over to Britain and became uh, well-known in a quite different way. So, mm. But, yeah, she's... Yeah, she's great. She's great in this film um, and, and really adds something to it. I, and I actually like... As much as I, it might sound like I'm knocking the film for kind of pushing a, a non-Gothic story into the Gothic realm, I like the bits where they do that and it works. And I wish they kind of done more like that. I think some of it, like the, the bit with the spider... It's not that great a scene. No. And it's more like, oh, this is a bit gothic -y and it's cheap. Let's do that. You know, I wish they'd come up with something better than that, you know. Um, and I'd be totally happy if, the, if there was more. She works, though. She's great. Um, and, 
and I, th- I, I although you've already talked a bit about Andre Morel, um, I want to just say a little bit more because he's a great lead. Yes. He is, as you say, for a large chunk of this film, he's the lead, and he's fantastic. And you're with um, Doctor Watson. He isn't an, an idiot. Um, he's obviously a little bit outpaced by Sherlock Holmes, but he recognises that. But he's 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 shrewd. He's wry. All the scenes where he talks to all the other characters are just really entertaining because he's so, um, you know, he's so, he conveys being interested so well. Mm. And, and also he's got that very English reserve about him, you know, he's, he's very gentlemanly, mm. but you also get the sense that he's not to be messed with. There's well, exactly. Something... When he takes centre stage, he he becomes the lead. He becomes the hero, and, and he's entirely comfortable in that. Mm. I think, yeah, we're fine. You know, we don't we don't really need Sherlock Holmes. Watson can kind of sort this out in a different way. He's not as brilliant as Sherlock Holmes, but he's pretty. You know, you get the feeling he's pretty resourceful, pretty tough. He can handle himself, and he's intelligent because he's a doctor. So, yeah, I think Andrew. Because I mean, I know people knock Nigel Bruce's performance. Yes, unjustly. Films. I don't. I think it's a great performance. I think it's suitable for those films. It's not. That's not the Doctor Watson of the books, but I think it works for those films, the Basil Rathbone films, to contrast with the brilliance and the sort of like the, the, the slightly brusque, slightly offhand sometimes character that Basil Rathbone plays. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't mind that at all. I think, I think he's funny. But, you know, Doctor Watson can be played in several different ways. He's a, he's a more, in a way, you know, Sherlock Holmes is such a defined character. Dr. Watson is, is a less defined character. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so, uh, you know, he can be played by John Mills or Nigel Stock or whoever. And they all work. And in this, he's played by Andre Morel, who, who I think is a great actor. And proved he's a leading actor by going on to play leading roles in other Hammer films like Plague of the Zombies and Shadow of the Cat and yeah. other things. So, and he's perfectly capable of playing the lead, you know, and, and Hammer recognised that. And he's a, he's a very comfortable presence and very kind of reassuring, but he's sort of... You know, he can handle himself. And he gets billing above Christopher Lee uh, yes. in the opening titles. So, you know, they, they clearly knew that he was important in the scheme of the film and it, and generally as an actor, you know. There's recently been a very nice Blu-ray of this film released, fully restored with commentary with Mark Gatiss, I think, and Jonathan Rigby and, and a documentary. And look looks great. I don't have a Blu-ray player, so it's no good to me. Not me. But I've seen some clips and... Um, Lee says that he loved this part because it's one of the few times when he's been able to play essentially a romantic lead. Well, yeah, he is playing a romantic lead in this, and he didn't. I mean, that's the thing about um, Christopher Lee. He was tight. He he did play a lot of slightly, rather kind of humorless authority figures. He yeah. seemed to be cast in that in that role, and he wasn't allowed to play romantic leads and and or, or character parts or anything anything like that. He was always kind of Cushing always had much more range. He was given lots of different characters to play. Uh, in the horror mm. genre. He was typecast by genre. He was not typecast by character in that genre. He played all sorts of parts. Yeah. Whereas Christopher Lee was always slightly more, maybe because of Dracula or whatever, um, maybe because he's just so tall, whatever, because of his voice. I don't know, yeah. but he was always typecast. Slightly more rigid. Rigid, rigid and all stiff or... Yeah. Uh, but no, as I say, I do think he's enjoying himself in this film. Mm. There is chemistry between him and Marla Landy. Um, and an interesting... It's an interesting relationship that develops between them that is kind of plot based on plausible attraction, although their personality types don't really uh, mesh at all. No. But um, that, that's kind of um, part of the point, and it, and it works, uh, I think. Oh, well, it's sometimes in life. Mm. Oh, yeah, works. oftentimes. Oftentimes, yeah. Um, you know, that, um, yeah, they, yeah, that's that's what it's all about. It, it don't mean a thing if I ain't got that zing, Howard, <laughs> or so I'm told. Um, that's what they say. So that's, that's what Shakespeare said. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think we're um, I think we're coming up to time, really. So we probably want to move on from talking about the Hand of the Baskervilles. Um, is there anything else we want to say about it, particularly? No, I just want to. I just want to say I think it's a terrific film. I think it's very enjoyable. I think everything about it is great, mm. apart from the script which just changes, I think, a little bit too much, tries to adhere to a formula that's proven to be successful in Hammer films, but just isn't quite uh, an adaption of the book. Mm. It doesn't really give the, 
the, the, the spirit of the book. But Cushing is great. Andre Morel is great. The whole cast. Francis de Wolf, another yeah. regular, is terrific in it. Marla Landy, she's marvellous in all sorts of ways. Uh, the, the production values, the sets, the costumes, everything, it's all hammer at its best. Yeah, I mean, it's a thoroughly enjoyable film. I, I think I've said it already, but I absolutely love that ruined church set and, and the scenes where you just kind of see them more at night, which are clearly filmed in studio. I think most of them are. But the, the colours in the sky and the silhouettes and things, just beautiful stuff, Jack Asher. And um, James Bernard music. Yeah. Um, there is a, in, in the opening Sir Hugo sequence, um, you know, there is a there is a reprise of some of the music from Dracula. Yes, which, I noticed that when I watched it again recently. Um, and which apparently uh, James Bernard like, said he, he didn't know that. Mm. And he'd written something else and he didn't find out until years later that they'd shoved a, a recycled piece of music in and he would never have done that. I don't know. Um, I, I think... Um, I think it works. It's really good. But it does bring me to uh, the question of when you started to get into Hammer films. I mean, when I first saw this film, I saw it before I saw any of the others because I didn't see it as a horror film. I didn't watch it because I was into horror films or Hammer. I watched it because I was scared of the Hand of the Baskervilles. My friend Ben Maders, I might try and get him to listen to this, not the Ben who I've previously involved in our um, escapades. He'll remember this. Um, at primary school, I was terrified of a ladybird book of the Hound of the Baskervilles. Because it had an absolutely terrifying cover of just this glowing demonic dog. And, you know, people, all the kids got to know that I was so scared of it. So they would sneak up to me from behind with the book and then shove the picture in front of my face. And I'd go, ah! you know, and I'd really freak out. Um, but that's kind of the thing that, that that allowed the Hand of the Baskervilles to sink its teeth into me, as to what. And... Um, uh, and and never let go. So I watched. I I got up very early one morning in about 1992, and watched a recording of Anna the Baskervilles. This film, I thought it was pretty good. Um, you know, really enjoyed it. Uh, didn't really know who anybody was. Um, but yeah, I remember. I remember being swept away. I remember being a little bit, bit being a bit disappointed by the appearance of the Hound. I think the Hound is always a bit disappointing in most of the versions. In fact, nearly all the versions I've seen. The Hound. It's difficult to do. It is very difficult to do because it kind of like, once you see it, mm. you know, it's built up so much in the book. It's built up so much in the story that once you actually see it, inevitably it's going to be disappointing. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's what you don't see is scarier than what you do see. And I quite, I don't know whether this is true or not, but I was quite amused by the story that in order to make the Hound look bigger, they got children to dress up in the costumes of the lead characters to stand by it to make it look yeah, yeah. they did do that um, in the hammer film but they didn't use any of the footage in right. the film because they just thought it was ridiculous i think terence fisher said in a very um uh, good useful book uh wayne kinsey's the brace studios years there's a quote from terence fisher where he said um it did look like a couple of kids and a very big dog <laughs> <laughs> which it was they used a great dane whose name famously was colonel who was just not that fast and they couldn't really get him to act threatening um he was quite big but he just wouldn't really do anything um and although in the book and most film versions um the idea is that the hound is a real dog but it's been made to look supernatural because they put paint on, paint on it in the hammer film they say they've, they've put a mask on it to make it look more frightening it's like uh, mm. again it's it's making it more physical and yeah. it's got this big weird head but um it, it just does, it doesn't look like much well uh, no you can't really tell no to be honest um, He's got a mask on. Well, there is this shot where um, Christopher Lee looks up and the hound is standing above him. It's like on a promontory. Um, but because of the way it's shot and because it's wearing this big mask on its head, it looks like it's got a massive head and a really small body and it just looks kind of comical. Um, so, yeah, they struggle with that a bit. I think there are some versions of the of the story where they, they've managed to do a decent hound. Again, not the Richard Roxburgh one, no. where it was made by the people who made Walking with Dinosaurs and they were all about CGI monsters and creatures. And they're like, yeah, we can do it, it'll be amazing. So they do have this big, weird, computer-generated creature that appears at the end, but it just looks, it's like, what the hell is that? Kind of thing. Yeah, but the thing is, the Hound of the Basketballs has to be a dog. Yeah, yeah. It's not a supernatural creature. It has to be a, a dog that could exist in real life, so it yeah. can't look, you know... No, no. Be CGI and look like a 
I d- some kind of strange creature. I do think the one in the Jeremy Brett version is quite good, where it is just a dog which kind of glows a bit because it's got stuff painted on it. And um, and actually, the, it's weird because in the Basil Rathbone one, when you see the Hound in the flashback with Sir Hugo, it's just a really vicious looking dog and it's genuinely alarming looking. Mm. You can see its teeth and, and, it, and it's quite scary. Then when it appears later on in the film, though, it, it doesn't make much of an impact. Strangely. But but yeah, but so but anyway, you, the the appearance of the hound is the only slight letdown in the film. Despite everything we've said, the rest of it is thoroughly enjoyable, yes. and even the and the ex- the climax is very exciting. Despite the appearance of the hound, everything else about the climax is really mm-hmm. dramatic and well done. The only other thing I want to say really about the movie, um, or rather ask about the movie Howard, is that you know, kind of going back to the James Bernard's recycled music bit. Also, there are recycled sets in this film. As I say, you know, in later years, once I'd become familiar with Hammer films, every time I tried to watch The Hound of the Baskervilles, I couldn't really get into it, because, like, that's not Baskerville Hall, it's Dracula's Castle. Mm. You know, it kind of looks very similar on the inside. Some of the outside fittings are exactly the same. Does that take you out of it a bit? Is that a danger of watching Hammer films, that you start to become too familiar with, especially the early ones, with the kind of recycled stuff? Or does that add to the charm? I would say that adds to the charm. Recently, I bought uh, a box set that had Plague of the Zombies and the Reptile on. Oh, yeah. Uh, And I watched them within a few days of And they both use the same... The ultimate example. Well, the same director on the same sets Mm. within the same couple of months. And some of the same cast. Yes. And you think, oh, yeah, I recognise that. But no, it doesn't take you out of it. No. Mm. I, I... because the film is so good that uh, no, yeah. no, it doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Well, I, I sometimes think it, when you can see how things are put together, you can see the cracks in a way, and your imagination goes into the cracks. I and, admire their ingenuity. Yeah, yeah. In uh, recycling the sets and everything. I, I think it just annoys me slightly just in this film, just because it's like I'm going. No, that's Baskerville Hall. It shouldn't look like that. Yeah. It shouldn't look like a, a gothic castle in Carpathia. You know, but it does. So there you go. And it is effect. You know, it is effective and strangely beautiful. Um, and just, a, a, I feel like I should say because you criticised the script. Um, do you know that Peter Bryan wrote the Plague of the Zombies? Uh, I think I did. And didn't he also write the Brides of Dracula? He co-wrote that. Co-wrote. Yeah. So, so when he's writing proper Hammer Gothic horror films, yeah, it's great. He's he's brilliant because those films are brilliant. Two of the best, actually. Two of the best Hammer films, in my opinion. I just... Uh, I don't think it's a bad... I just think they've had to change things. They've had to slightly twist things and distort things in order to make this story into a Hammer horror film, and it doesn't quite fit. It well, doesn't quite work. Yeah. Things have to be changed, like people with webbed hands. And when you see the guy with the webbed hand, you kind of know he's going to be the villain. So... But is he, Howard? But is he, well, really? Perfect. Well, anyway... Um, yeah, and I and I think uh, again, I I did used to get annoyed with, with this film because I'm a Hammer fan, but also a Sherlock Holmes film fan, and it's like this film is not one thing nor the other; it's kind of in between, and you kind of have to accept that and enjoy it as that, and and it is a strange mixture of um, kind of pleasures, really. Mm. But a, a, a great piece of work, and you know what? I love the fact um, this is the final thing I'm mentioning. And then we're going to finish, unless you want to add anything else, Howard. No, I think so. Okay, the final thing I'm going to mention that I love about this film is the very first thing in the film. It's the fact that when the uh, logo of the distributor, which I think is Universal International, but might be different depending on which print you watch, it fades to black, and before the music comes up and the credits start, you've just got a black screen and a thunder crack. Mm. And I love the confidence of that. It's like three or four films in, Hammer know exactly what they're doing now and they know what you're here for. It's doom, it's it's atmosphere, it's style. And it's like, boom! Yeah. And then you slowly have this fade up to um, a classical matte painting of the, uh, of the hall with Hammer Film Productions presents. And the music comes up and it's like, it's a great opening. Yes. And then you go straight from the credits into the flashback. This is the other thing. Some versions, including the book, you know, they have, they don't tell you the flashback straight at the start. The flashback comes in the middle when Dr. Mortimer tells it to Sherlock Holmes, or even later on. But in this version, you're right in there. And again, that's Hammer. It's like, we're going to show you. That's what I love about Hammer. 
yeah, yeah. It's their confidence. It's their unapologetically going for it. And and it's um, such a, oh, it's a horrific little kind of vignette. Um, it's beautiful. You know, the red of all the guys' jackets shines out the night. That you know, especially with Sir Hugo, the, the red in his eyes and the red on his jacket, um, the, the the set decoration, the full bloodedness of it, and the way that David Oxley says. Who does she think she is that she does this to me? Damn her, damn her! And he sort of tears her handkerchief up that she's left behind. You know, everything about it is is full on and that's completely appropriate. In a way, what I would like to do is re-edit different versions of The Hound of the Baskervilles and put this flashback into whichever film the rest of it would be because it's, it's like a little film in itself and it's just beautiful. So there we go, folks, The Hound of the Baskervilles. Yes, it's very good. If it's on on a Sunday afternoon, you sit down and watch it and you'll thoroughly enjoy it. And Cushing's great, Andre Morel is great, everybody's... It's it's great, it's and Hammer. You, and you know what? And it's because a few Hammer films have a slight crossover appeal into another genre. And because of the Sherlock Holmes thing, yeah, this film will often be on on a Saturday afternoon or Sunday afternoon. Sit down and watch it. A lot of people will see this and it'll be their only ever Hammer film. And it'll be an enjoyable experience. My, I know my niece said to me a few years ago, she watched it and she loved it. I don't think she's ever watched any others. It's potentially a good way in. Mm. But if it's the only one you ever see, it's pretty good as well. Yes. So. Although do see others. Yes, for <laughs> God's sake. Don't miss out on The Bride of Dracula, for heaven's sake. No, or Frankenstein must be destroyed. Indeed. Indeed.